The value of science and technology in the wool industry is often hotly debated and at times even divisive. But the numbers are certainly adding up for South Australian grower John Simons, who's turned his once unviable property on Kangaroo Island into a golden fleece. And as Kerry State reports, the 12-year turnaround is more than just a personal triumph. When you farm on an island with a hefty freight bill and restricted access to markets, wool makes a lot of sense. It's something pretty easy to do from an environment like this. Um, it's a bit of a problem getting livestock, I think, to the, to the mainland. So that they look presentable and at a reasonable cost, so I've always been fairly dogged and pursued this wool industry. Come here, Jack, come here. For decades, wool has been the backbone of agriculture on Kangaroo Island. But as in most parts of Australia, when the stocks piled up and the market crashed in the late 80s, many tables out here stopped turning. And when diseases like ovine yoni started threatening some flocks, even the biggest wool fans were questioning their futures. We were doing it pretty tough. For a variety of reasons, we owed a fair bit of money and uh, banks were being pretty miserable. Um, so, yeah, we had to do some, something different. John Simons runs Turkey Lane, a 530 hectare property with a commercial flock of around 6,000 merinos. His father was a soldier settler out here, so his family has lived through many of the ups and downs of the wool industry. When fibre flopped, many graziers diversified, but this devoted grower stuck with wool, focusing instead on producing a finer fleece to try and break into the premium end of the market. So he looked for rams with lower microns to add into the mix. But what he gained in quality he lost in quantity. We had a declining wool clip, certainly dropping some microns, but not fast enough. And um, if I kept dropping cut at that speed to go down to 20, then it was going to be a pretty horrible case. Enter Greg Johnson, the island's vet, who also runs a group that aims to improve the productivity and profitability of the local sheep industry. He saw the Simons place as an opportunity to help more than one struggling grower. We were looking to put together a demonstration farm or a focus farm that we could actually put in place a lot of the management uh, structure that we, uh, we think is ideal for Kangaroo Island and also uh, demonstrate and evaluate um, a number of other technologies including advanced breeding. So when he sort of said, well look I'd like to basically take over your property and, and how it's run, what were your thoughts? Um, well, I was in with the chance of making a quid, so that was pretty always pretty encouraging to me. Zero, two, four, two. In 2000, the duo set a six-year goal. To reduce the micron count of the commercial flock to 20, a drop of three and a half, while maintaining a cut of 50 kilos of greasy wool per hectare. They delayed lambing, increased stocking rates and rescheduled shearing. 0956. They also started benchmarking or measuring the flock to find out what needed fixing. And then went looking for the right genetics to do just that. Now a lot of people told us that it was impossible to increase the amount of wool that the sheep would cut and decrease fibre donor at the same time, but that's been absolutely nonsense and we've been able to show in this flock that it's infinitely possible to do that if you understand the way you go about selecting your rams. For John Simons, keeping his animals disease free was a priority. So they decided to close the flock and set up a mini stud on the property keeping the best ewes and artificially inseminating them with semen from rams with the desired traits. 
To find those rams, they searched a database which uses measurements from sheep to calculate their genetic potential or breeding value. So all of these sheep have Australian sheep breeding values and to look at what they are for an individual sheep we just bring up the data and we've got a range of uh, wool breeding values for these rams, uh, greasy fleece weight, yield, uh, clean fleece weight, fibre diameter CV, fibre diameter, staple strength, staple length and parasite resistance. So when you're deciding which ones to breed from or say which ones to, to buy in, do you just consider one of those ASBVs or do you combine them? You need to combine all of those traits into one economic value and that's done through the production of an index so it makes it much easier for producers to actually then rank sheep against each other. And the beauty of Australian sheep breeding values is that rams right across Australia with ASBVs can be compared to one another. Twelve years ago the rams at Turkey Lane would have been well down the list. Not anymore. The particular ram we're looking at has an FP plus index of 162.8 which puts it in the top 1% of sheep in Australia. It's not just the, the sheep's own measured performance, it's, it's the measured performance of him or her if it's a ewe and all of its rel known relatives. Um, very, very powerful way of, of knowing exactly what that sheep might produce. The more traditional approach of assessing how animals look and stand is still part of the selection process. But John Simon says he trusts the numbers more than his own eyes. Greg and I are no great sheep men. Uh, I'd suggest that if either one of us went to judge the top ram out of the Sydney show, we'd, um, we'd probably be embarrassed. But uh, nonetheless, the two of us with the aid of the, the figures can turn out a wool production flock that I think will measure along with most. I mean, what I would love to see is not an abandonment of, of the, sh the show ring and the show arena, but just that those sheep that go in there um, have verification of how good they are genetically as well. Playing the numbers game can be time consuming and there is a fee to be part of Merino Select, the industry's main breeding values database. But this wool veteran isn't complaining because he's come out a winner and what's going into these bags is a lot more valuable than it used to be. Not only has Turkey Lane achieved its six-year goal, it's gone on to kick a few more. This year, I'd expect to come in under at least 19 micron, maybe a touch under for the flock average. And um, I'd expect to cut pretty near the same amount of wool per adult sheep this year as what we did when we first went into this. I mean, premiums are not that high right at the moment, and there's been other periods in time where, it, where they've been close together. But on average, it would be worth about 85000 you know, perhaps up to 90000 a year. We'd be better off. Or well, for someone as simple as me, that's an income by itself. So the actual income uh, generation for the property has actually quadrupled in the, last, uh, in the last 12 years. One of the great things about the income trend line for this property is that it's increasing at such a high rate that there's a divergence away from the cost line. This is quite different to a lot of farms where there's a cost price squeeze going on. That's uh, a marvellous result for them. Um, I'm, I'm not sure of the baseline that they're off, but um, uh, certainly, you know, prima facie, those figures are, uh, sound remarkable. While these producers are convinced the scientific approach is worth the effort and say they have the figures to prove it, the majority of merino studs in Australia haven't jumped on board, with less than 20% using breeding values. In this Melbourne laboratory, wool samples are put through their paces, plucked, pulled and measured with high-tech precision. It's this sort of rigorous testing John Simons relies on to get an accurate read on how his flock is performing. And he's not alone. Samples from 90,000 individual merinos, mainly rams, are measured each year. But that leaves many more which are not subjected to the same scrutiny. So if this is so successful, why isn't everyone doing it? That's a very good question. I think that part of the problem within the, the Australian uh, merino sheep industry in particular is it's quite conservative. And people are quite reluctant to, to change. For a lot of people it's just easy to do what they have been doing year in, year out. In most businesses that gets you nowhere. You know, if you're not improving, you're going backwards and that's exactly the situation in the wool industry. I think that's simplistic. 
for many, many generations, they've demonstrated they're willing to change the animal and adjust the animal to those uh, particular uh, environmental challenges that they might have wherever they might be. So Stuart McCulloch heads the industry's uh, main R&D body, uh, Australian uh, Wool Innovation. It's helped fund the development of Australian sheep breeding values, but says they're just one tool in the kit. That uh, success in Kangaroo Island has been good for that particular uh, wool grower. There's, uh, there's um, you know, other stories that aren't so, uh, aren't so promising. The accuracy of breeding values does vary. Forecasting fleece weight and fibre diameter, for example, are usually pretty reliable. Other traits are more tricky to predict. If you're dealing with a low heritability trait like worm egg count, just the, the measured performance of that animal alone um, is not necessarily going to give you a very high accuracy. But once you start bringing in lots of relatives, or particularly if you start getting lots of progeny from a ram, then the accuracy goes up quite a lot. Chair of Kangaroo Island Agriculture clearly believes breeding for worm resistance is worth the effort. Not only has the stud owner and commercial grower been keeping a close eye on the progress at John Simon's farm, Andrew Heinrich, or Aphid as he's known, has also spent the last 15 years looking beneath the surface of his own sheep. And while spooning out poo samples may not be his favourite task, he says the figures that have come from these specimens are starting to gain favour. We started this just to breed our own rams and, and for biosecurity reasons. Now there's demand. We've got a lot of farmers wanting to buy um, merino rams off us. Um, a lot of the semen sales are on breeding valleys. They tell me 60% of the semen sales in Australia are on breeding valleys because people want those elite genetics. And I, I think that in 10 years' time, uh, you will struggle to, to, to sell a ram without breeding valleys. It's been proven to work in other industries. Um, you know, the dairy industry has made fantastic progress on, on traits with very low heritability by using exactly this technology. Um, the, the beef industry, the lamb industry, uh, the pig industry to some degree, they've, all of these industries have made fantastic genetic progress by using quantitative genetic um, theory. And there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't work in merinos, and it does work and it works extremely efficiently. The uh, genetic diversification of the of the merino sheep or sheep in general is 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 massive, um, as opposed to the dairy industry where it's basically you know uh, two breeds and, and and very confined. So you know there's different challenges um, uh, for uh, different industries, and and to simply say that that works for that industry and should work for yours um, is uh, is a little bit simplistic. The role of genetics in the wool industry has certainly been a major talking point in recent times. While some believe breeding the best sheep is more of an art, growers like John Simons and Aphid Heinrich say figures are the future. And they're still furious over AWI's decision last year not to fund its share of stage two of the information nucleus a national genomics project which analyzes the DNA of thousands of sheep, including some on this property, to help predict how they'll perform. If they want to make this a cottage industry, they're doing a very good job at it. You know, I'm very angry about it. Um, if we, we need to embrace science and, and technology and, 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 and move forward. AWI says there isn't enough evidence the project will benefit the majority of its shareholders and levy payers, but insists it's committed to genetics and genomics, investing $27 million over the last decade. We rejected one project. We've got about another eight going in that area. There's been a huge amount of hype about this. There remains a, a, a huge amount of hype about this. And I think a lot of it's unnecessary, to be honest. As for Kangaroo Island's own focus flock, John Simon says there's plenty of potential for future generations to climb even further up the ranks. Keep up, Jack. There's studs out there well in front of us that we can still target you. Um, top index is about 180. 
So, you know, there's still the index points for us to chase out there. Uh, come up there, Henry, come back. There's no reason why they won't continue on. And now we can, because the, the property is as, as profitable as it is, we can now look at reinvesting some of that profit back into further structural improvements, um, improvements in pastures, fertiliser rates, improvements in soil ecology. There would not be a property in Australia that's producing more that can't do significantly better than what they're currently doing. So on-farm productivity, I think it is still the number one area that we should be focusing on from the point of view of improving the lot of Australian wool growers.